So with the written test out of the way, today I'm heading to my flight school, set up a plan of attack to get flight test ready. But I wish it was a rule that you have to have at least five hours in actual IMC conditions just to really see what it's like. So right heading 300. And I should have probably asked you to check we're clear right because we are VFR. Yeah. That's a failure item on the, on the flight test, is that correct? Well, it certainly does keep the examiner a shrinker from getting any tighter than necessary. I've done a lot of pretty cool flying over the last few years, but not any real instrument training. So that stuff is once again atrophied. I don't regret any of the cool stuff I've gotten to do over the past couple years, but it's definitely stopped me from doing any instrument flying. This has been a start and stop thing since like 2013, 2014. Getting back into it, I want to build a workflow that's consistent. So today we're going to be in a plane that I've never been in before, and but it'll be what we'll use for the basis of the training. This is the instrument rating status vlog. It's not a typical Flight Chops episode, so if you're not into a nerdy IFR deep dive, check out one of the many other awesome episodes which are published every other Friday. Regardless, I think there's some great learning moments here, and I'm happy to share them. However, please note production values in this vlog are sort of compromised because I was training first and filming second. Okay, so I'll brief you on what I think the plan is and what the weather is, and then you tell me how I did or how that usually goes. Is that yeah. how you typically do it? Well, there's, so let's actually we'll back up a little bit. One of the things that changes big after you become a, a private pilot is that your instructor is no longer holding your hand. At Burlington Traffic, it's Golf Golf Hotel, about to depart runway 27 at Burlington, straight out. Your instructor is going to get a really nice, warm, fuzzy feeling if they know that you've covered all the bases. Mm -hmm. So I know that my airplane is IFR capable. Yeah. Uh, one of our aircraft right now is not IFR legal, so make sure that we're not booked in that. Um, check the weather, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes. And in this area, because of the congestion around Toronto, is uh, you need to get a flow number. Another new aspect for me is going to be learning the Garmin 430. So we can get through the familiarity with this thing. The buttonology on the 430 is the same as newer units, making it easy to transition. We're just going to put in Kitchener, just so that we have the sort of the point-to-point -point flight plan in there. It just makes it easier because then you can also invert it for coming back. But now if you hit procedure, then you can select an approach. In this case, we're going to hold it to Wellington Beacon, which is associated with the ILS-26. So we would pick the ILS-26, and then from that we would cherry pick the Wellington Beacon out and then head directly there. We're not going to do that until airborne, that part of yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, there's not much point yet. Now, we also talked about today, we could probably just do a VFR flight with simulated IFR and not do a flow number, is that the plan? That is true. If you can't get a flow number, provided that you can maintain legal VFR mm -hmm. at all times, and that means a few things, which is worth noting, because one of the things I notice with a lot of people when they come in for recurrency training or they, they've been away from flying for a while and then I sit down and I say, okay, let's review airspace. And let's look at where class E is and class C and class G and everything else. And in a lot of cases, they will they might be able to identify the boundary of it, but they don't know where it starts and ends. And then if they're actually able to pull that off, now I ask, them, okay, but now what is the implications of being in this airspace? What are you allowed to do? Can you be at this altitude? What's the visibility got to be? And then they, that's when they go deer in the headlights. Okay, so I'll pretend I'm under the hood now and I've already dealt with my clearance. Yeah. I, I want to fake that part of it. Turbo Golf Hotel, maintain runway heading, uh, climb 2,500. Okay, maintain runway heading and climbing to 2,500 for Turbo Golf Hotel. I would have called Burlington traffic that I'm departing the area. Yeah, that's the other conundrum, but if we were up in the soup right now, then there wouldn't be anybody else flying anyway, so. We would have had to avoid time clearance from the ground in that case. Yeah. When you have somebody that doesn't understand the implications of what they have to do in airspace, then this going uh, VFR, flying IFR procedures could meet some, you know. Sketchiness. Some sketchiness, yeah. that's a good word. <laughs> and the other is that I think that it also, as much as I try to mimic my buddies at air traffic control and, and what I'll do is I'll say, you know, if I'm saying, hey, Steve, watch your altitude, that's me as an instructor giving you some advice. But if I say triple golf hotel, turn left heading three, five, you know, now I'm, sure. now I'm talking to you like an air traffic controller and I expect you to talk back to me like one and that way you stay in the mode. Okay, so then he'll say uh, you can proceed direct to the Wellington Beacon. All right. So, right. the only way to really do that field? is with GPS. Yeah, yeah, so you can load the procedure. And the oh. other thing, too, is that remember that it's a very easy job for him 
to say, can I have an initial vector, please? That's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I would ask for that now then? Yeah. Can I, can I get an initial vector to the to be? Sure, he'll say, sure, turn right heading 300. Oh, right heading 300. And then at least that gets you going in the right general direction. And so I should have probably asked you to check we're clear right because we are VFR. Yeah. That's a failure item right? on the check on the flight test, is that correct? Well, it certainly, certainly does keep the examiner shrinker from getting any tighter than necessary. It, it might be fun if you want to say watch your altitude ATC, you can ask uh, Trooper Golf Hotel, can you uh, confirm your at? You know? Oh yeah, I would use the same verbiage if you exceeded it by the same amount that they start chirping you at. Roger. Okay. In fact, if you, uh, most typical autopilot systems, when uh, when you don't actually put the autopilot on, if you set an altitude there, it'll alert you when you're within a thousand feet as you're approaching that altitude. And when you level out at that altitude, if you deviate by more than 200 up or down, it'll say altitude. So as you go through 200? As you go through 200. So you've already failed your flight so test. So you've already failed your flight test, and pretty soon, right after the ATC. altitude alerter says something, ATC is going to say something, right. too, because their tolerances are at 200 yeah. feet as well. Okay. So, yeah, I try to, try to make it realistic, but unfortunately, it's not. The realism, just like going into IMC, you know, like I, I personally believe that anybody that's going for an IFR rating, especially if they're going to become a commercial pilot they won't make it a rule because they just won't but i wish it was a rule that you have to have at least five hours in actual imc conditions just to really see what it's like but we can do that voluntarily right well that's the nice thing about getting a flow number is that now you are legal to go into yeah. a cloud or, or fly above a cloud deck or or whatever whereas when we're practicing there's there's two more conundrums one is that you're not allowed to violate vfr weather minimum and the second is, in theory, even the procedures that you're doing need to be within, you know, like if the, the cloud deck is only 300 feet above that, well, now you have to conduct the procedure turn 200 feet lower than you're supposed to. But now you're not following the procedure that's depicted on the chart. All right, so then we're gonna check our uh, compass. I can produce here. Still good. Engine instruments are still good. We've leaned. Feel we're not gonna change for now. So, Wind cruise check three, complete, one, I thought it off zero, my head, but... Yeah. Alright, we're far enough two, west seven, now, you can see the... Uh -huh. We can climb up to 3,000. Okay, so we'll go back, okay, so go back to Rich. Yeah. Do you want to move into a weather briefing? Yeah, I always tell them to check the winds aloft at three and 6,000 feet, because that's the altitudes that you typically hold or do procedures at. And then I want to know where we're expecting the clouds. If it's if we are going IFR, where's the bottoms, where's the tops, what what are the types, any convective or icing issues that we have to think about, and and not just here, not just there, but in between. Okay, so and I did complete my cruise check, so I'm going to maintain my altitude. Um, I checked that, so we're still good. Heading bug is set. Now I can go ahead and uh, get my yeah, load going. the approach. If I knew how to do it, I would. So procedure. Select approach. Yep. Enter. Yep. And now we want the ILS 26. So enter. Hit enter. And you want the Wellington Beacon, Big which knob. is ZKF. Enter. Enter. And just load it. Go oh, enter. Yeah. So now it's loaded, but the weight, the active leg is still from Burlington at the Kitchener Airport. So now if you push the small button here, the one that says push for cursor, now you can scroll down with the big button down to ZKF and hit direct to and enter and enter and now you've got Rooting to the Wellington Beacon. That's your active waypoint. And that's now and talking that's, to that? Yeah. And I know that because it says GPS and what did I? It says GPS here. Okay. See if you push that, it goes to VLOC. So. So VLOC, now it's talking to the nav radio. Yes. So back to CDI one more time. Yep. And what does OBS do again? OBS is uh, basically, it creates a, it turns any sort of a waypoint yeah, into a phantom VOR, so you, so you, you can shoot radials out of it. You can line yeah. up on, on radials. But you know, the other neat thing is, take a look now, so your your guidance is directly to the Wellington Beacon and the uh, localizer frequency has already been automatically loaded into the standby on the nav side. Right. So you can flip it over to the active. It's not going to do you any good because the CDI is still in GPS mode, but at least it's ready for you and as part of your plate briefing you can go, hey, do I have my localizer loaded? Right. 
All right, now next thing, ATIS. Yep, so, so ATIS on the number two radio. The far flight is handily telling me that, so it's 125.1. So do you want me to give you that briefing? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, yeah, on the way in I did call, and then I also looked at it. Yeah. The thing that I was confused by that the briefer brought up was icing risk um, isn't addressed in anything because of the uh, temperatures I'm thinking, but he did say, you know, you could get some light rime. If it's snow, it's like gonna just bounce off, right? If it's snow, it'll bounce off, but so actually that's an interesting question with icing. A lot of people go, well, icing's forecast, I can't go. So it isn't forecast. It isn't forecast, but let's just say it was forecast uh -huh. for a second, yep. okay? Is it legal to file? Into no one icing, it is not if you have a non fiki airplane. Okay, you kind of jumped ahead there because you're right about that, but what I was asking is if it's forecast to be icing, can you file into it with a non-ice protected airplane? If you if you know that it won't be at your altitude or your, right? Isn't that uh, the deal? So here's the difference between what's legal and what's smart. Because if it's forecast, it's just that. It's not known icing. Uh, icing has occurred where it wasn't forecast, and obviously it hasn't occurred where it was forecast. So the only real known icing is known icing. Mm -hmm. And an airplane that's certified for flight into known icing means you're going into icing and you can go, hey, I'm okay because I got an airplane that's certified for flight into known icing. I guess the next level of known icing would be a pyrep. Somebody else saying, yeah, I was over the Ancaster Beacon at 3,000 feet and I was picking up ice. You get there 15 minutes later at 3,000 feet and you go, what the heck was he talking about? There's no ice here. Mm -hmm. Or you might get over there and nobody reported it and you're flying around in it and all of a sudden it's like, hey, I'm getting covered in ice and nobody told me it was going to happen. So technically, from a, at least from a private aircraft standpoint, with sort of, with uh, commercial charter operators and stuff, it might say something in their, in their op spec, their operating specifications, that if icing is forecast, they're not allowed to go. Private pilot, it could be forecast. I mean, I'm not saying it's smart a lot of times, but it could be forecast and you can still legally go. So isn't forecast considered no one ice? No, because it's forecast. So Pyrep is the only Pyrep one. in reality is one of the knowns because that pie that mm -hmm. created the rep is in ice. So therefore he must know it. And you would know it if you were in it. Wow, okay, I never really thought it through that far because it's always like you just are scared of it in the forecast. Well, you should be. Yeah. You should be You should be respectful of it, but there's an old saying, ice is where you find it. Mm -hmm. And and that means that it's still a, like everything else in weather. It's a bit of an inexact science. And, uh, you know, I've encountered ice where it wasn't forecast and quite, quite extensive. I'll, I'll give you a picture of an airplane that I was flying in that went into an area where there was no icing forecast and in less than 15 minutes, it looks like somebody sprayed glue and then threw cornflakes at it. Wow. It's just splat. That was mixed or rhyme or what do you call that? It was probably severe rhyme icing. Severe rhyme. Yeah. yeah. It was a 172. I'll send you the picture. I was flying with a guy who was working on his reading and it was like, okay, there's commercial jets coming in behind you. You got to kind of keep it up and we couldn't. And the guy said, okay, I got to break you off. And he put us on long downwind. And we're literally watching little wisps of openings of blue. So literally all we had to do was climb another 500 feet and we would have been above the layer. But, you know, a lot of IFR pilots, when they're fresh at it, they kind of get a little bit, you know, they feel like this is what the guy told me to do. So therefore that's what I have to do. And all he would have had to say was, look, can, I, can you give me another 500 feet or a yeah. thousand feet? And all his problems would have been solved. So it was a great learning opportunity for him, but it accumulated very quickly. <laughs> Waterloo Regional Airport, information Romeo, Weather at two zero 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 Zulu, automated observation, wind two niner zero at thirteen, gusting twenty, visibility niner, few clouds at two thousand niner hundred, temperature minus eight, dew point minus one five, altimeter three zero two seven, approach, localizer runway two six, arriving and departing runway two six. Okay, so. That addresses the weather briefing aspect. The visibility is because we're going to be in class Echo and Delta. Uh, we need three mile visibility, 500 feet horizontal and one mile from the cloud. I think we're not going to deal, we're going to be playing around at 3,000 probably doing yep. most of our work. Yeah. So you look at the procedure altitudes, that's what we're going to try and stick with. If they try and park us at a, in a hold at a higher altitude, then we, we might have to say <laughs> unable. 
So we're yeah. probably going to be doing the local one or the ILS one too. Well, that's now the next part, yeah. right? Now we're into, okay, what are we going to do when we get there? So for this one, I was originally hoping to replicate this episode I did in 2014. Uh, we flew the Loke 1-2 in Hamilton, and uh, I thought it'd be cool to like basically pick up right where we left off, but Dennis made a good point. The conditions simply weren't conducive to that. Do what makes sense for the weather that we've got. So in other words, we've got a strong west wind, and you, if you want to practice a precision approach and a strong west-northwesterly wind, are you going to do an ILS that goes southeast? Not really. Not much point, right? Because mm -hmm. you wouldn't do that in real life. Yeah. And things are going to be happening very quickly. Like you're going to be grounding 180 knots going into the ILS 12 in the Hamilton. Yeah. So what we can do is say, well, let's pick something that does work. Let's do an R and F 24 in the Hamilton, or let's go to Kitchener and do the ILS 26, or you know mm -hmm. something like that. So that pre-flight briefing was so thorough. I didn't want to really throw away the nuggets. So I decided I was going to break this vlog five into an A and B part. So in part B, which I'll publish as soon as possible, uh, we're gonna do the hold and the approach and really debrief that stuff in great detail. I'll probably publish a more typical episode um, the Friday before that one comes out, but watch for it soon. In the meantime, keep your flight chop sharp. And I got Hoover with me today. He's uh, doing a lot better. In the previous episode, I was talking about him being sick and I kinda didn't really provide any closure on that and a few people were worried about him. Uh, he was just having digestive issues that were kind of mysterious and keeping us up at night. But uh, in the end, it turns out, I guess the vet has diagnosed that he's allergic to some or all animal proteins. So instead of trying to do an elimination diet to figure it out, we just went straight to full vegetarian kibble. And he's doing a lot better, so... We have a vegetarian dog. <laughs>